say that of all the issues being considered and discussed and debated at the United Nations since its inception, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the imperative of Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires complete nuclear disarmament, is the most important subject the United Nations is considering or could possibly consider. The United Nations deals with some horrific subjects. They deal with genocide of a particular race or nation. They deal with horrific tortures, female genital mutilation, um, poverty, um, tsunamis, earthquakes, but the devastation that would be created by a nuclear war is no question about it. Ultimately, the obliteration of mankind and of the earth as we know it. The How realistic do you think is this threat is to our world today? Very realistic. And the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty debates made clear the schism between the countries which have nuclear weapons and the countries which do not. I think it's important that we go into some history. Uh, the Manhattan Project was started and it included many theoretical physicists working on the production of an atomic bomb because there was fear that Nazi Germany would produce a bomb one of the greatest physicists in the world, who ultimately won the Nobel Prize for creating the Pugwash Conference to eliminate nuclear weapons, was Joseph Rothblatt, who joined the Manhattan Project to help create an atomic bomb before Nazi Germany had it. He found out to his horror by 1944, first that Nazi Germany had abandoned all work on a nuclear weapon, and that General Leslie Groves was determined to complete the work of the Manhattan Project and to produce an atomic weapon to intimidate the Soviet Union. Joseph Rothblatt at that point was horrified because the Soviet Union was our ally in fighting Nazism. And so this agenda, which was in some respects unique to General Groves and to the military industrial complex, was anathema to him. He was trailed by uh, agents of the U.S. government. He was defamed, he was slandered. He eventually left the country and I believe could not return. Was accused of being a spy, which of course he was not. Eventually when he won the Nobel Prize, of course he was invited back. Now, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at a time when the Japanese were actually suing for surrender, for peace. That's the question I wanted to ask you. Do you think, like by popular opinion in the United States of America, it was done as a necessity of war, or it was just a demonstration of power, a demonstration of political muscles to other countries like Soviet Union and China? It, the information that was brought out by James Carroll, the son of General Joseph Carroll of the Defense Intelligence Agency was that Japan was already close to surrender, that the propaganda used to justify the atrocity of the dropping of an atomic bomb on a civilian population in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the propaganda, propaganda was nothing but that propaganda. In fact, this did not shorten the war, it did not save millions of lives. What it did was to demonstrate on human guinea pigs the horrific power of the atomic bomb. Testimony of survivors, if you can call it survival, described the consequences to the people who were near the epicenter of the bomb which was dropped. People whose skin was falling off of their 
bodies whose eyeballs were popping out of their heads, who were walking down the street carrying their intestines, which had fallen out of their bodies. And of course, they were dying for water and pouring into the rivers where most of them perished. The descriptions of the horrors of the bomb at that time are unspeakably chilling, but the fact is that the damage of the radioactivity pursued these people for decades and caused cancers for them, for their children, and this was one bomb on Hiroshima, one bomb on Nagasaki. There are now thousands of bombs. They are controlled by nine powers, the United States, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, Israel, uh, and North Korea. As an American, apart from being, you know, an expert and having the profession that you have, but as, as a civilian, what was your attitude uh, towards this whole situation, that your country was the first one to use it actually on living people, the atomic bomb? I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, as an American, it's almost impossible to describe the horror that I feel at what we did to defenseless human beings. Japan, as a nation, was an aggressor. They committed horrific atrocities in China. The rape of Nanking was, uh, was an indescribable act of barbarism by the Japanese army. But these were not the Japanese people who were the victims of the dropping of the atomic bomb, nor were they stopped by this bomb. And so as an American, I feel very ashamed that my country was the first to use a nuclear weapon. And I should add that we then forced other countries to develop nuclear weapons to defend themselves because it was clear that the U.S. was willing to use the bomb. So the Soviet Union had to develop a nuclear arsenal and so did China because both countries were socialist countries. It was not their desire to develop a powerful military. They needed to invest their money in civilian purposes, in, in raising the standard of living of their people, in uh, investment in education, health So you consider this as a desperate effort for self-protection? Yes. And as long as the United States does not totally dismantle and destroy all of its nuclear weapons, Russia and China and indeed North Korea have no choice really but to keep some nuclear defense. And this is, is putting the world on a war footing. The concept of nuclear deterrence is a horrible way to run a, a world that one country can blow up another country, which can then blow up the first country, and, and then it all gets out of control, and the human species is contaminated by radioactivity, which will blow wherever the wind blows, and uh, the Earth will no longer be able to sustain human life. This happened in an accident in Chernobyl, where the rich black earth of Ukraine and by the Russia became radioactive by an accident. And we had most recently Fukushima and the devastation of, of Japan. You of know, so it's an ongoing thing. But do you think these countries are so reluctant to give up their nuclear arsenals, the ones that MPT is negotiating with, because of these self-protection issues and concerns? Absolutely. I think that, uh, well, one could say there's a nuclear club of nine countries which have the capacity to destroy the rest of the world. There is a, an enormous and now um, complete consensus among the non-nuclear powers that nuclear weapons are a threat to the survival of humanity. The Austrian pledge is attempting to get um, 
a statement, I believe, by the International Court of Justice that it is illegal to have nuclear weapons in one's possession. I think they should get the term into the whatever judgment that it is criminal to have nuclear weapons. And as long as they exist, humanity is in great jeopardy. The speech is coming from countries such as Costa Rica, even New Zealand, um, that were arguing with the current draft of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which prohibits nuclear conflagration. They objected to the word conflagration. They said any nuclear detonation will result in human catastrophe. Not only human catastrophe, of course, animals and, and the earth becomes uh, at best useless. It then becomes dangerous. Water is contaminated. Um, in Japan, of course, after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, people were desperately thirsty, but they couldn't drink the water because it was contaminated. Basically, it can become a, a, a future suicide for humanity in general. Yes. What do we do to avoid this? So, you have been through these long discussions about this non-proliferation treaty. You have gone to countless meetings, you have seen these negotiations. What do you think is being done? Why are we at this stalemate that we are? And what kind of steps do you think should be taken to take us out of it? I think something needs to be um, something needs to be mandated. How that would come about, I don't know. By UN? I, it, that would help. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, let me make some comments about some of the speeches. The Russian speech, which is on April 27th by Mr. Ulyanov, um, stated, and I'll read this, in fact it is U.S. policy that hinders further nuclear reductions. This can be explained by its intransigent course which effectively undermines strategic stability in the world through unilateral buildup of the global missile defense system, gradual advancement toward implementing the prompt global strike concept, attempt to stop in the tracks the negotiation on banning the placement of weapons in outer space, and lack of progress in ratifying the CTVT at the national level. The Chinese and the Russians have year after year put through the first committee on disarmament um, a proposal to prevent the use of outer space for weapons of mass destruction. And of course the whole idea of putting nuclear weapons in outer space is almost incomprehensible. The human mind cannot absorb the terrors that that would inflict. You asked for the um, the way in which, in which uh, this menace to humanity's survival could be brought under control, there is something called full spectrum spectrum dominance, which is part of U.S. military doctrine: control of the air, control of land, control of the sea, and control of outer space. This is an extremely dangerous concept and it comes with the agenda of global domination. This is part of capitalism, part of the suicidal thrust to control all the resources of the world to maximize profit for a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of the human species at the great expense of the rest. Now, I would say that many countries are attempting to put a break on the great danger we're hurtling toward. The Chinese speech, was, which was delivered by Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Li Baodong, stated explicitly 
that China, as a staunch champion for nuclear disarmament process, stands for the complete prohibition and thorough destruction of nuclear weapons and has faithfully fulfilled its nuclear disarmament obligations under the treaty. Over the decades, China has pursued a nuclear strategy of self-defense and has kept its nuclear arsenal at the minimal level required for its national security. Among nuclear weapon states, only China has pledged unconditionally not to be the first to use nuclear weapons and not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states. Now this is extremely important. The Soviet Union had had a no first use doctrine. Once the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was almost compelled to abandon that because they were surrounded by NATO bases and nuclear uh, um, or missile defense um, what's it, deployments on NATO bases surrounding Russia, which would essentially um, completely deprive Russia of any means of, of protection. And there is another very important issue that you kept mentioning countless times. It's uh, the stockpiling of nuclear weapons in non-nuclear states. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, this is another very devious method of extending the threat and the menace of nuclear weapons. The United States now has nuclear weapons in, I believe it's seven non-nuclear states. So if you talk about the essence of this issue, how important and how dangerous this is? Uh, the essence of this issue, it's the most important issue that the United Nations could be, uh, could be confronting. One could almost say that this is the reason why the United Nations was created, to prevent a repetition of the horrors of World War II. Uh, the horrors of World War III would be beyond imagining. Many, I people, that, many people say that would be the last war. For Albert Einstein said, well, after the nuclear weapons were completed, he said, the next war will be fought with ours, and the war after that will be fought with sticks and stones. I think it's also very important that uh, that I include in this discussion a superb um, statement by Jackie Cabasso, Planet and Planet Mobilization for a Nuclear-Free, Peaceful, Just, and Sustainable World. Quote, we issue this call at a crucial juncture in history, a moment when the unresolved tensions of a deeply inequitable society, great power ambitions, and the destructive effects of an unsustainable economic system are exploding into overlapping crises. Tensions among nuclear-armed countries are rising amid circumstances that bear worrisome resemblance to those that brought the world wars of the last century. For the first time in the nuclear age, we are in a sustained global economic crisis that is deepening the gulf between rich and poor in a starkly two-tier world. Extreme economic inequality and the economic policies that create it, NATO's aggressive expansion, struggles over diminishing fossil fuels, food price spikes and crop failures drive wars and revive arms races from Iraq to Syria to Ukraine to South Asia to the Western Pacific. We face a moment in which policies that benefit a fraction of the world's population feed conflicts that could precipitate catastrophic wars, even nuclear wars, and in which the power to make war is wieldly by wielded by largely unaccountable elites. Jackie Cabasso, in her 
usually brilliant fashion, has welded together the economic basis of the creation of the most horrific system of weapons humanity has ever devised. And it's very interesting at one of the most advanced stages, if you can call it advanced, of monopoly capitalism, a suicidal system which uh, ultimately <coughs> becomes fascism. You have a world which is teetering now on the edge of nuclear Armageddon. And this is the most important issue. Well, the million dollar question here, what should be done? What could be done? And which part of this old UN has to play? That is indeed the million dollar question. It may be almost unanswerable at this point. Uh, there are developments in the world which are to some extent uh, promising. The alliance of Russia and China is a counterbalance to the power of the United States. Of course, the US is so threatened by this, God knows what they might do in a suicidal uh, burst of hubris. The creation of alternative economic resources such as the BRICS, the Bank of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. The China's new Asia International Investment Bank are offering alternatives to the IMF, the World Bank, and USAID, which were notoriously exploitative. Um, economic mechanisms which uh, diminished the infrastructure sustaining human, human life in countries to which they were donating so-called aid at the cost of structural adjustment policies which destroyed the lives of vast numbers of the citizens of the recipient countries. Now, the US uh, the IMF and the World Bank were so aggressive about imposing themselves upon other countries that when governments resisted, such as Prince Sihanouk in Cambodia, he was overthrown. Mm -hmm. So you have movements now of countries which have become awakened to the menace of monopoly capitalism and are trying to create independent resources which would enable them to to exit from from the control and many people many experts actually noted that after the collapse of the Soviet Union since we had polarized world only one pole you know of power it's been unhealthy for the world in general and unhealthy for the United States as well yeah. so a lot of experts say that if we create some other poles of influence and strength, it would be overall beneficial for all of us, for all the humanity. I think that's unquestionably the case. The Soviet Union provided, um, in many respects, a very healthy balance. It was an atheist state. And in and of itself, it prevented the development of the kind of religious extremism, which is a form of religious pathology, that we now see everywhere well, I can't say everywhere, but in many countries, and which is being used in many cases as uh, cannon fodder for um, disabling state control of indigenous resources, enabling the multinational corporations to go into failed states and take over the natural resources. Just another instrument of control, right? Yes. And in many respects, I was in, in Moscow when Queen Elizabeth II visited Boris Yeltsin. And one of her ladies-in-waiting uh, said to me that she was married to an Orthodox Jewish rabbi in England who said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a disaster for the whole world and that there would be tidal waves of devastation 
that would be forthcoming in the future. This was said to me in 1992, and since then we have seen such destabilization of large areas of the world, the Middle East, Africa. Now there are terrorist organizations in parts of Russia and even in parts of China. And to some extent, this is being used, again, as a means of control and terrorization. Um, but it is also part of a destabilization of the global economy as a result of the collapse of the one social system which made it imperative that human needs be given the highest priority in government policy. Do you think if Soviet Union still existed, we would have these issues like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Syrian crisis, and so on and so forth? Do you think they would dare, these marginalized you know, groups, to, to do what they are doing uh, with the presence and power of Soviet Union and uh, of not unipolarized, but of balanced world? I think it would have been more difficult for them to function if to ever exist. I think it's important to recognize that many, many of the countries of the Middle East which now have ISIS and Al-Qaeda had secular governments that were very progressive. Iran, for example, under Mossadegh, the prime minister who was overthrown uh, by the CIA, wanted to use Iran's resources for the benefit of the Iranian people. He had nothing to do with religious extremism. There were many countries where you had governments that actually were concerned about the welfare of their people, education, health care. Libya was one of those countries. Iraq was one of those countries. And Perhaps the most important thing to point out in all of this, that it was in the 1970s when Afghanistan had secular governments and eventually when Najibullah, a socialist, was president of Afghanistan, a man who required all children to go to school, boys and girls who provided free education and whose government ministries included women in the highest level of government. It was at that time that the United States was arming, training, and funding Islamic extremists for the purpose of provoking the Soviet Union to invade, which it was expected would bleed the Soviet economy which it did. To sum it up, especially, you know, in the face of this non-proliferation treaty, endless conversations, discussions, and uh, conferences going on at the United Nations, do you think UN got somewhere with that? Or the issue is as serious as it was and still requires lots of work? Well, I think we should call this program, as I mentioned to you, the requiem of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. I was present at the meeting on the 22nd of May when, in fact, the non-proliferation treaty uh, failed to achieve a consensus. And it was the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada which were responsible for the failure of consensus of the draft of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now, the Cuban delegation made a very important comment. They said that the Non-Proliferation Treaty was really not in the interest of the non-nuclear states. It was actually for the benefit of the nuclear powers. However, as I pointed out, many of the nuclear powers would have preferred not to have to become nuclear powers because this diverted their resources from investment in the welfare of their people into a military structure that they did not want and did not need, and that in fact weakened their programs of socialism. And perhaps that was the whole goal of the arms race, 
was to diminish the effectiveness of the socialist models in order to demonstrate to the world, well, socialism fails. So do you think that this issue, MPT issue, is not going anywhere anytime soon of UN's and world's agenda? Off the agenda, did you say? Yeah, of unresolved issues. May 22nd was a very, very, very uh, demoralized evening on behalf of uh, the non-aligned movement, Iran expressed its greatest, greatest disappointment. In fact, it was Iran which had asked for an additional hour for discussions in the hope that they could reach a consensus. And it was the U.S. delegation which blamed uh, the situation in the Middle East, specifically Egypt, for their uh, refusal to join a consensus. But in fact, the reality is quite simple. As I discussed with Jonathan Grana, who is one of the experts who's been dedicated to the non-proliferation treaty for decades, it's quite simple. The United States doesn't want to give up its nuclear weapons. And so it will find an excuse not to join the consensus. Because as long as it possesses nuclear weapons, it can dominate the world. And so it's a vicious cycle. If U.S. does not give them up, then the other countries have to stick to them out of self-preservation issues. Yes. It's, it's a very simple matter. But this is a very dangerous game because at any point control of this entire apparatus could be lost. Nuclear Armageddon could be tri triggered by a mistake, yes. Do you think UN is aware where all these negotiations should be aimed at? Primarily? Well, the UN is not monolithic. Uh, many of the countries are aware of where the negotiations should be headed and should finally reach. And there are countries that are determined to prevent this from happening. So there's a paralysis at the United Nations. It might have to be resolved only by the facts on the ground. The fact that China is becoming a very strong power could actually exert a very, very stabilizing influence globally. And it is possible that the United States does not like the idea of a competitor of that size and that force. Competitors, probably, several Competitors, other yes, yeah. yes. Brazil <laughs> is strengthening India. Well, that's a hopeful note, and let's finish on that this time. Thank you very much. Again, as a reminder, this was Carla Stea, Special Correspondent at the United Nations for Global Research and an expert on international and global issues.